Good afternoon and thank you for attending. Uh, welcome to the meeting of the Strategy and Resources Policy Committee. Um, first item is apologies for absence. We have received apologies from councillors Terry Fox, Julie Grocourt, Brian Lodge and Nick Rooney. Next item on the agenda is election of chair. Do we have any nominations? Um, I'd like to nominate Shafak Mohammed. I'll second that. Okay, can we have a, a vote on that? It's been moved and seconded. Can we just vote on that motion, please? Thank you. Are we on? Sorry. Thank you. Sorry for the slight delay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending. Uh, and welcome to this meeting of the Strategy and Resources Committee. The meeting today is open to the public. However, Appendix 7 on the agenda is not available to the public or press because it contains exempt information. If members wish to discuss the information in Appendix 7, we will need to ask members of the public and the press to kind of leave for that part of the meeting will pause the webcast. We have received no questions from members of the public by the deadline. Please can I request that all of us, um, that mobile phones and other equipment are switched on silent so not to disturb the meeting. There is no planned fire uh, test today. If there is an emergency evacuation, please take the instructions from town hall staff. Assembly point is Tudor Square. Can I ask each assembly member to introduce themselves? Assembly member, sorry. Each committee member to introduce themselves. So I'll start from our right. Douglas? Yep, Douglas Johnson, City Ward. Andrew Ardentio, Dun Helen Chalvey Ward. And uh, Jobs and Dawn Tartley Ward, Chair of Waste and Street Team. My name is Councillor Paul Wood and I am the member representing the Woodhouse Ward. Good afternoon, my name is Richard Williams and I'm a councillor for the Stannington Ward. Uh, I'm Martin Smith, uh, Doran Totley Ward and Chair of the Economic Development Committee. And uh, my name is Shafak Mohammed, I'm uh, Councillor for Ecclesall Ward. Okay, so we've done... We've got the apologies from Councillor Fox, Councillor Grocott, Councillor Lodge and Councillor Rooney and I think everyone else is present. Um, item 3 is exclusion of press and public so as, as above the appendix to item 7 on the agenda is not available to the public or press because it contains exempt information as I said earlier. If members want to discuss information in the dependency then we will ask the press and public to leave and the webcast will be turned off. <coughs> So, next item is item four. Can I ask whether members have any declaration of interest in any of the items on the agenda today? I see none. Okay, there has been no public questions or petitions <coughs> received. Um, so, could I swiftly move on to item six, which is budget update 2023-24 delivery options and I see colleagues... Uh, do you want to, do we have name tags or not today? No. Oh, there you are. Yes. So, Liz, I know who you are, but how could you... Um... Yeah, Liz Goff. I'm at the head of finance and commercial business partnering. Okay, and I'd like to welcome Tom. Tom, you want to introduce... Oh, Tony, sorry. You could be Tom. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, 
post to another report. If I can just give a quick update, it's a, a verbal update today. So we reported last week at the 5th that we hadn't balanced the 23-24 budget and that officers and members were working towards that position. There are a number of proposals that are being considered by members alongside the anticipated government funding proposals that the Council announced on the 17th of November, which we hope will bring us into a manageable budget position. We expect the detail of the local government financial settlement next week, uh, but we are getting increasingly confident that the Council will be compensated for the business rate support that they're going to the businesses, uh, but we're not sure yet whether additional social care funding will bring additional burdens or not, So, but we hope that any of that will be covered by the grants, which will give us any pressures. We intend to bring a paper next week to the 19th with an update and the next steps on the budget report on, online to take it to the 24th of January uh, co committee so it can go through the full council 1st of March. Okay, thank okay. you. I have before me in the notes that a proposal, uh, proposal that this item, item is going to be at 10.30. Is that, are, we, are we right with that timing? Yeah, it's 10. Next week. So, sorry, Chair, yes. Uh, the item is on the agenda for 10.30 next week, so I think probably it's just to note the verbal update today. Yeah. Angela? Yeah, I was placeholder. Okay. So we are happy to receive that report. Councillor Smith? <coughs> just a quick question. So... In, in our committee, we've had some experience with the Shared Prosperity Fund being the announcement being very, very late. You said that the, we're expecting a government announcement on the, the financial settlement. Um, oh, are officers ready for that? So, like, how much time do you need after getting the papal blessing from Westminster <coughs> to then present the final budget pack to us? And are you? Does that mean, how confident are we that we can have that substantive discussion on Monday? In terms of the settlement data, we're expecting it on the 21st of December, but we're getting some noise coming through from various um, lobbying bodies like Sigoba that we're members of that are giving us indications of that. We are well uh, practised in the fact that the, the, the settlements tend to come out usually the last week of Christmas, so the team are well geared up, ready to do it. Uh, get the, the paperwork done. So hopefully uh, from, on a Monday we'll have quite a good position about what we think the business rates will be, what those proposals are that members are still discussing this week to give us hopefully a balanced position on, on Monday. So any other comments? No. So we've been asked to uh, that we agree to kind of take this report next week at 10.30, is all colleagues in agreement? No dissent? No, there is no dissent, really. It's next week. Okay, so could we then move on to item seven, Fargate shipping containers? There is a supplementary report that, as I said earlier, is restricted. So... <coughs> How do you want to, shall we, are we happy to proceed? Yeah. Okay, so, is there a, yes, David, do you want to explain, go on. Sorry, I, you, I, it's probably just helpful to give some context in that because of, the, particularly for people who are watching, uh, because of the weather, that's why we've had the number of apologies we've had. Um, which was members who were anticipating attending today but have been unable to attend. Um, members will know that we don't have substitutions for this committee, so they've not been able to provide substitutions. So that's why we've got the attendance today that we have. Um, we couldn't defer this meeting in advance because once the summons has been issued legally, as long as we can get a core at attendance, then the matter has to be listed and you have to at least consider agenda items. However, one of the options open to you, if you feel that it's more appropriate to defer, is a matter that you can do. Thank you, David. Uh, right, I'll just see Joe first, then Andrew. Uh, yeah, Chair, I think we, I think we should proceed with this item. I think um, uh, you know the, the traders in the container park have, would 
would benefit from having certainty a week sooner, if, if, given that they're trading up to Christmas, um, depending on the option with the, which, is, which is chosen. Um, the whole membership of the committee has had a chance to, to, to share their views at, at CMT last week, so I, I understand that that discussion is what these, these proposals are based on. So, um, uh, and there are members of all parties represented here, and I think on that basis it would be reasonable to, to make a decision. Thank you. Um, Angela? I was uh, going to propose that we defer just on the, um, you know, in the spirit of being collegiate and cooperative and seeing that one of the groups is basically not here, sorry for typing you. Um, so uh, I, I'm just trying to be um, um, conciliatory. Okay. Um, Martin? Thank you, Chair. I, I agree with Councillor Rotten. Um, it's the first chance we really as a committee or any committee have been asked to ask any detailed questions on a project that's let's be honest not gone very well and is highly controversial so by deferring it I'd be particularly disappointed to, to lose the opportunity of asking some questions as to what's going on thank you so I think we should go ahead Councillor Wood, do you? It's 2-2 two, two at the moment. I agree with Angela, we should defer. So I think, um, thank you, Chair. Um, I have a sympathy for the uh, request to defer, but I think it's the, that I agree with Joe. I think the people who are currently operating out of those need some clarity. So I think we should proceed. Okay, David, we have three free, and possibly one other vote. So I think, well, if you're going to defer, I think it's whether Councillor Argenzio or Councillor Wood or Councillor Johnson want to formally propose that and whether there's a seconder and then take a vote on whether we defer and, and see the outcome of that vote. Okay, um, can I propose to defer until next Monday then if we can deal with it properly at the next meeting? And that's seconded by Councillor Wood. Okay, so could I have all those in favour of deferring till next week? Three. Okay, those four. Let's say against for doing it today. We'll do it then. Four, three, we'll do it today. Okay. So we are going to proceed. Uh, do you want to introduce yourselves, Richard and Ben? And then we'll take it from there. Afternoon, councillors. My name is Richard Ayer. I'm the director of Street Scene and Regulation. I'm Ben Bells, who's currently working in the core team. Okay, who's going to take us through the report and then we'll go to members' questions? Um, I'll take us through the, uh, the report then, uh, Chair. Um, so, I've submitted a, a report um, with a number of um, recommendations for the committee to consider. Um, there are four options um, within the report um, that consider uh, either continuing with the current um, proposal of operating the retail units as they currently are and pausing and taking further consideration of uh, what we do about the, the final complete area of, of the upper level. Um, there's a, an option um, where we can consider continuing operation and finalising areas of the upper level. Um, there's an area where we can consider continuing operation and working with somebody else. 
and there's a final option where we can pause all of the uh, above actions. So in terms of the recommendations of the report, um, we're proposing that the uh, first option, which is the one where we continue operation up to Christmas and with the traders post Christmas, um, while we take further consideration what we do um, following the Christmas period and the relocation of containers would be the, the preferred option to, uh, to, to propose to the committee. Um, and in terms of um, those proposals, sorry, I'm just trying to, sorry, I'm just having problems with my laptop. Um, and with those further proposals then to um, continue to support those tenants with advice and guidance um, post Christmas in terms of operating and relocating and then bringing a further paper forward in January where we can um, consider the options appraisals that we'll be developing over the next few weeks and then in line with good reflective practice um, reviewing how this process has um, continued and worked up to this stage outlining future learning for projects. Thanks, Chair. Just to, just to add to that, we've now got seven independent businesses trading on the lower ground, um, been trading since mid-October, doing particularly well, particularly now the Christmas market's open. Um, it was busy over the weekend, uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons behind option wise to allow them to trade at least up to and just past Christmas. Okay, thank you. Any questions first? But I will say that anyone who wants to make reference to the closed section, could we leave that towards the end? And let's just deal with the, the public document first. Uh, so questions on the public document. Anyone wants any questions or comments? Uh, okay, Councillor Martin Smith. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to to um, yeah to ask some questions and um, I believe all of my questions are related to the, the, the public bit please stop me if I, I go off that can, can I just go back to the very beginning of the project so my understanding from the report is it wasn't put out to tender it, it, is that correct the report talks about um, one company expressed an interest um, but how did we go about testing the market and were there any other companies out there that, that wanted to put a bid in but we, we declined? Thank you. Um, yeah, in terms of the um, process involved in developing this the contained proposal, we did some market research across the country looking at different operators that could build and design as well as operate container parks. So we also looked at existing container parks that were operating. Um, we couldn't find anyone that would build, design and operate from that market proposal. So we only got one um, submission back through, which was from Steel Yard, and they were able to design, build and operate and those are the ones that we've received. Thank you. So my understanding from the public procurement process is that large orders or contracts above a certain threshold value uh, we're obliged to put those out to the general market. I think we use the, I think it's called the Your Hub process at the moment. So obviously a decision was taken not to use that. Um, wh whose decision was that? Um, so the um, procurement process it involves procurement professionals. So um, the process was signed off. Um, by the head of uh, procurement at the time, in conjunction with myself and Richard as client. The customer can just hold. David, do you want to come in? Yeah, I think ultimately the procurement strategy was signed off at cooperative executive at some point. We, it was signed off as going out on a single tender, and just dealing with the procurement law point because this is a concession contract. It's dealt with under the concession regulations and there's a th there's a higher threshold for the value before we are legally obliged to go out to the market which for these types of contracts is based on turnover 
and it's only where the turnover is over five million pounds, inclusive of about that we are required to go out to the market to advertise. Okay, Councillor Smith. Thank you. Thank you for that. I've, I've got another couple of questions, but I'll let colleagues. Councillor Larton. No. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I um, I was going to come a little bit later. I'm just. I, I, I suppose I'm a little concerned about how we ended up having to use a diesel generator. I mean, there's a number of things that have gone wrong, but the diesel generator in particular, because as my committee were bringing proposals forward for street trading of um, food outlets, where we're going to want to encourage them to use the electricity where it's available. So um, what went wrong with this? And it, it, you know, it, we're, we're in a weaker position doing that if, if kind of our big project wasn't able to connect to the electricity. Can I, can I have an explanation for that, please? Yeah, um, there's been a maintained power supply in that location for a number of years um, and the city centre management team um, have been paying for that connection to, to be there, although the actual infrastructure was removed a while ago. Um, as part of this process, we're expecting to connect into that existing infrastructure, uh, reconnect the infrastructure that would have been there. Unfortunately, when we got to actually connecting into the powers and, and dug in, it appeared that the um, power supply that had been there had been removed through some emergency works, uh, which we had not been made aware of. Any more further questions, Jeremy? Or do you want to come back later? Angela's this evening. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, as there's been quite a few things that have gone wrong with this, project and there's been quite a considerable delay considering that it's not a permanent project. Um, how will we ensure as an authority that we don't do something like this again without checking the water, the electricity, you know, that really basic things that I thought would be the first thing we do before we agree something as substantial as this. So is there anything kind of in terms of lesson learned so that in five years time we don't do something similar again. Thanks councillor. Um, yeah uh, I completely agree I think there's some lessons to be learned from this. Um, there needs to be a, a full debrief uh, and a review of what we've done here and, 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 and learn those lessons going forward. I think just to set the scene the context um, as Ben's explained there was power down there and City Centre Management team have been keeping that power supply live, or so they thought, especially just for the new markets and the new future high streets fund. So um, best intentions, there was a supply there. It's only when we've actually dug down on site and we've not found the supply and then utilities company said actually we've disconnected during an emergency repair uh, and not told us. So we've been paid for it, which we need to recover from the utilities company. So that's that aspect. On the water side, um, the issue was um, do the, from the planning consent, and uh, we don't need to consult the Yorkshire Water for a temporary planning consent like this. Um, however, afterwards, Yorkshire Water came forward to say that they got concerns it was over their main sewer. Um, the reason we'd not informally consulted is because we've had um, structures of more uh, more tonnage on that site. If you can remember the Sheffield Eye a few years ago, the, the big, big wheel, which is probably four times the weight of the containers, that was in the same spot and there was no issues at all and Yorkshire Water were part of that consent because it was longer term planning. So um, that's why Yorkshire Water, Yorkshire, Water, Yorkshire, Water, Yorkshire Water went consulted at that point. So I think um, true and fair officers have, have made the right decisions or assumptions, but I think there's lots of lessons to be learned about how we've handled this process and we, that will be part of the debrief. Any further questions? Just a comment. Maybe we shouldn't make assumptions ever. <laughs> Okay, um, Councillor Williams and Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, it says in the purpose of the report is to set out options going forward, but actually, to me, the most important phrase is in the recommendation that is the final one on the open page. In line with good reflective practice, a review is undertaken on the container project, outlining learning for future projects. Now, to me, that's the key thing, because it's, I've heard there's been a number of things that have not gone the way we thought. And we really do, taking your point, we really do need to learn going forward. But it is actually quite pleasing to hear from, from Richard that uh, the traders are actually getting some good business out of this because it's, I think the whole project has been slightly overshadowed and I'm glad it's not failing for them. Thank you. OK, 
Councillor Otten, then. Yeah, if, we, uh, if you're sorry, ready. Sorry, sorry. Councillor Johnson. Sorry. sorry. Are, are we moving to comments? I'll, I'll no, come no. in on you. Sorry. Okay, yeah, sure. Just, just um, a couple of questions just about the, the traders there. I mean, with, with the generators, I mean, I think we've flagged up already, um, kind of flagged up some weeks ago, frankly, that, you know, we weren't happy with running generators in the middle of the city centre when we're actually trying to do some work on clean air. But with the traders, though, have there been discussions with them about, um, about you know, taking the, the structure down and, and getting, getting rid of it? I mean, I think I've been fairly clear that, you know, we shouldn't throw more good money after bad on this. Um, it's, it's planned to be moved anyway, so if it's just bringing forward that planned move uh, a little earlier. Have there been any consultations with the trades to see about how they could cope with that? The, the, the trade is also there. It is a temporary um, uh, infrastructure, um, and we have had some conversations about this process. But it's also very clear that there's a decision to be made here. So we've not got followed through with what that final consultation will be until the decision is made here. Well, if we can follow up on that, I mean, um, we had an informal discussion recently where I think a lot of people were fairly clear we wanted to close it down. There's some discussion about when, but I think it probably depends on just the the practicalities of um, how to arrange that with the traders. They need to be planning ahead too, um, rather than just asking you know, the council to bail out their, their fuel costs. Actually, the other question I've got is just actually what's the prospects of reclaiming um, the reclaiming the cost of the electricity and the generator from um, presumably power grid if they've misled us by <laughs> taking our money for a supply that they weren't actually providing. Thanks, Councillor Douglas. Uh, yeah, we're talking to um, the utility suppliers. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, they have misled us. We've been paying for this for a couple of years, so there will be some money coming back to the council from that. What that is yet, we don't know, but obviously that will help offset the, the, the cost pressure on the, the containers. Thanks for that. I'd uh, Councillor Otten and Councillor Smith um, for comments. Who wants to go first? Uh, thank you. Um, yes, so, I mean, obviously, we there's two... There's two Comments in one of the two sections of my comments. One is kind of how we got here, and the other is obviously recognizing that this is where we are, where we where we go. Um, I mean, I agree with the, the, the things that have been said so far in terms of um, the, well, the things that have been said so far. But I, I just wanted to comment, I suppose, and maybe I should have brought this as a question. The, this is funded by the Get Building Fund grant, which is one of these kind of post COVID or leveling up or, you know, get on with it type funds. Um, now, it strikes me that we, you know, that some, sometimes these funds are quite time limited. You've got to get on with it, you've got to spend it or you don't get it. And the danger therefore is that you don't, you know, you spend it on something that is not possibly the best use of the money. Uh, and I think we need to be in a position as a council where we can, you know, we've got projects that we've thought about reasonably carefully that are going to do a lot of lasting good on the high street or wherever it is um, that we can then put into put into train put into train when 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 these kind of funds come along um, because you know the, the fact is that yes we can complain about you know you've got to spend the money or, or, or lose it quickly and that's not doesn't help us to be effective but we we want to be um, effective with the, with the grant money that we get and I think we've, we've, we've missed an opportunity here to spend the money on something of, of, of greater permanent value um, so so that's I think the lesson I would like to learn is you know sort of handling handling um, grant funding from the government and spending it on spending it on better value things and I, I'm reminded of the, the third of a million that's been again grant funding from the government being spent on on eight flats in Orchard Square um, it doesn't strike me as the, the best the best value for money for public money. Um, although you know it would be very nice for, for the developer who gets to build those flats and sell them. Um, so the second thing is where do we go from here, and that is um, clearly there are traders in there who we you know we we, we we wish the best. We have no grudge against. We wish the best for. I think certainly. I mean, my my feeling is option one of the options in front of us um, allows those traders to continue trading uh, certainly until after Christmas. Potentially for longer if we if we don't have a um, you know w w until well potentially for longer 
depending on when we decide the containers have to be moved. I think we need to think about the move, we need to think about where it's going, and whether the, the whole thing is going to be an asset in another location. Um, and if it is, probably move it there in one go. It probably is probably more cost effective than taking it away and then dismantling it and then reassembling it. So um, I would like to see proposals come to us sooner rather than later in terms of where we think it will be valuable as, a, as an asset in a final destination. Um, and if it isn't, if there isn't anything like that, then we've got to, we've got to cut our losses, haven't we? Because, like, as I agree with Councillor Johnson, we don't want to be spending throwing good money after bad. So um, I, I, I might support option one and, and to have a, you know, sooner rather than later, have a, a, a good think about what use can be made of the facility and, you know, whether it is worth finishing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Do, do either one of you want to come back on anything that Councillor Otten said? No. Yeah, Richard? Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, th thanks for that, Councillor Otten. Uh, I suppose where, where, this, where this came from originally, um, we were put under pressure to have a tight deadline to, to spend this. Uh, the concept, um, as councillors are aware, was uh, really to sort of give Fargate a shot in the home, particularly as we start to get to the sort of darker months. Um, this has been proven to work in many other cities, um, Shoreditch, Boxport, London, um, Bristol have looked at this. Um, we've had the guys from Boxport come to Sheffield and actually say Sheffield is prime for a box park type setup before. So it has been tested, the sort of need, if you like, for um, some, a container park like this. Um, however, as we've already said, I think the, the delivery, we need to review and, and find out what's going on. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy about the actual principle around the scheme and the value it should bring, and it is bringing to some extent, but it should have brought in, in, a, in, a, in a bigger way is uh, it's the right move forward to, to have a container park. Thank you. Councillor Smith? Yeah, thank you for that, Chair. A um, couple of things. I start off by agreeing with Councillor Rotten. Um, whatever's happened, people that are working in those units downstairs, it's not their fault. And we need to think about them, job security, in the run-up to Christmas. Um, I also... Um, uh, uh, agree with Richard around these container parks have been successful elsewhere in the country which does beg the question why the hell has it gone so badly wrong here because let's be honest it has been a bit of a shambles um, um, one thing that I just wanted to ask a final question Chair um, we said at the very beginning that a, a number of alternative suppliers were excluded because they um, uh, the, the one that we went with was able to offer the um, design service of it. They took on the design, the accountability for the design. Did they also take on the consequential losses that have been incurred because of some of the design issues? So, for example, um, the, the, the weight over the uh, sewer or the access to the top floor. Can you just assure us that, you know, we put a contract out based on design accountability and that's being followed through into the finances as well. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the concession agreement, um, and again, I'm just looking to David to make sure I don't stray into anything that um, perhaps sh I shouldn't do at this point. Uh, but the the, um, the concession agreement covers off um, them to design, build, and operate the containers, and there's, there's also a number of conditions in there around that. That wasn't quite the question I asked, and I will look at David there. So if if, if somebody takes on the, the the question was really around, we put the contract out on the basis that a company was prepared to accept the uh, they were offering the to take on the design. Have they taken on the consequential costs of any issues there? I'm trying to pick the words carefully. Or have they, yeah, have we, you know what I'm trying to get to here. Is that question allowed in the public thing? Because I think that's a really important issue. If, if I give a generic answer to which it will depend upon the terms of the actual contract, and if we want to get into that, then we need to. Yeah. Um, 
it will depend upon the actual terms because there will be limits around um, what liability and what risk the operator takes on and then you move into things like um, force majeure as well and whether things might fall within those clauses. So the generic answer is it depends. That's a typical lawyer's answer for you. So, um, okay. but yeah, we, if you wanted to get into the detail then we need to look at it differently. I mean, I was going to say, Martin, you're veering towards appendix, which is close. Um, is there any other comment on the open bit? Councillor Autumn, final time. I, I just want another stab at, at what Councillor Smith was trying to get at. I mean, I think the point is, if, if this contractor was chosen because they were taking on um, more than other potential people were, did they, if you can tell us, um, did they actually take that on or have they passed the consequences of their decisions back to the council in terms of liabilities? Because, because if, if they have, then the, the reason for preferring them in the first place wasn't sound, was it? Yeah. So, um, no, David, that's, right, that's, that's not a question we're going to allow at this point. Any other, sorry, any other questions or comments, Angela? I want to say something as well, by the way. Um, just in terms of... Um, the procurement, maybe we do need either, even when we are under threshold, I think we have to be even more robust in terms of procurement because there's too many things that have gone wrong with this process. So that could be part of the lesson learned maybe. Um, I think it, if there is a threshold, I, I think that's just, um, correct me if I'm wrong, David, but it's, it doesn't mean that we can't put extra measures in just to be sure, um, just to be you know, really um, cautious. Because, I mean, there is an element of risk in whatever we do and we put in place in the city design. We have to accept that. Mm. Uh, but because there is so much that has gone wrong with this particular one, it could be a lesson learned that we ensure that the procurement is there even when legally we don't have to do it. Can I say a few words? I mean, for me, it just feels like a missed opportunity. The fact that we could have had this development open in the summer with all the success that uh, you know, Councillor Smith knows this about the UEFA women's football that we had, the opportunities that a, a very nice British summer afforded a northern city like Sheffield this year. Um, and it just seems like so many things could have gone right and we seem to have fallen at every hurdle. And I really hope that both you know, yourselves, Ben, Richard and others, we, we will have a, a genuine kind of review, analysis, inquiry, whatever you want to call it, into how we got here and how things didn't work out. And clearly going forward, uh, like Councillor Otten says, we need to now make sure that we do give some certainty to the uh, businesses that are there and particularly about the future location. So we look forward to that report. Can I just ask you a question, Joe? You posed a question that veered into the private bit. Is that going to sway your, because you've already made a recommendation, is that going to change your mind? Or could that not be answered privately by officers later? Yeah, thank you. No, I don't, yeah, I, I don't need, I don't, um, yes, it's not going to change the recommendation. It's, it's more of a learning point for, the, okay. for how we got here, so, which I do think can, needs to be so, followed up, but it doesn't need to be, yeah. Can, can I suggest officers follow that up? with a private confidential email to Council Orton, or possibly the rest of us, actually. Um, but we do have a proposal from Council Orton. Do you want to propose that again? Just Yes, thank you, Chair. So, so uh, of the options in front of us, option one is to allow the, um, allow the operation on the ground floor to continue, allow the traders to continue trading um, while we review options for the site, but not to, not to throw any good money after bad, as it were, in terms of further construction um, and uh, work on the, the upper floor, which in any case wouldn't be uh, available before Christmas. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm proposing we follow the, the officer recommendation, which is option one um, in the paper. Thank you. Do we have, do we have a second, uh, Councillor Wood? Thank you. So, Councillor Johnson. So, yeah, just uh, going back to the revenue thing, so a proposal there to actually throw some good money after bad anyway to fund for it. I just wonder if we can, uh, this funding, I think it's, uh, 
the sort of figure there of um, how much we're being asked to put into it. Um, and, and what budget does that come out of? Is that something that needs to come to this committee because it's outside the usual budget process? Thanks, Councillor. Um, yeah, so the, the ongoing revenue costs, any new revenue costs will be taken from City Centre Management Team revenue account. Thanks. Uh, and I'm just checking, <laughs> have we got the figure that we, yeah. I've seen the figure, but um, uh, um, can we say what the figure is in the open session? No. Are we, it's, it's an yeah. undisclosed yeah. figure, is it? Okay. So, so the, the operational costs are in the, the public report. So that they're, they're about oh, well, right. yeah, they're, how, how much are we looking at? So, so we, 1.12? 1.12, I think so it is. No, it's the 1.12. 1.12, wasn't it? Yeah, 1.1, sorry. 1.12 in the open report. 1.12 okay. in the open report oh, as, as figures. Uh, revenue operational costs approximately 17,000 a month, yeah. 10,000 of which is the, is the generator hire and fuel. Yeah, okay. So are we talking about um, paying an extra 17,000 a month to effectively to subsidize those businesses that are operating there? Okay. okay. To, keep, to keep them running. running yeah, there. absolutely. Right, okay. Right. So uh, uh, just, just for clarity, and particularly for the members of the public watching, because this has been quite a complicated, I'm just going to read out exactly what option one is. So, which is the office recommendation, by the way, is to pause further work complete the first floor bar, balcony, a lift access until an options appraisal can be developed, setting out the choices of the future of the container development. To fund from revenue the operational costs required to continue operating the retail food screen and temporary bar on the ground floor until at least one, uh, the 1st of January 2023. To support the current tenants with advice and guidance to continue trading in January and fi or find alternative retail units in the city centre if desired. To bring forward a further paper for decision in January once an options appraisal has been produced with proposals to use the containers after removal from Fargate. In line with good reflective practice, a review to undertake on the container project only in learning for future projects. That is the option that Councillor Otten has proposed and Councillor Wood has seconded. Could I see those committee members in agreement to that option? Do you want to show your hands? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, all of us. Um, therefore, I don't think we need to go abstentions or others. Okay. Thank you for that, and thank you, Richard and Ben, for your attendance today. And no doubt, we'll come back to this in the new year. So, do you want to come forward? Just want to just remind people that the committee on the 5th of December we deferred capital program additional list in appendix one section a transport regeneration climate change dash Arundel gate bus gate to the meeting today and it was agreed to be dealt with as an urgent matter. Um, do you want that roll? Uh, an item of business may be considered at the meeting of a council or a committee or a subcommittee as a matter of urgency where it has not been possible to give five, day, five clear working days notice on the recommendation of chairs. The reason for the, for the urgency is that Arundel Gate, Bus Gate, which is coming a mouthful now, project must be included in the capital programme on this time to enable the necessary work to start in January 2023. And this will be recorded in the minutes. A uh, report relating the item has been now made available to the public inspection supplementary agenda pack. Presenting officers today, I'm told, are Tom Finnegan Smith. And it says Damien, but you're not Damien. I know you're not Damien. I know. Um, so I don't know why it said Damien, but do you, who wants to introduce the report? Oh, I actually, um, are we okay to proceed with this one as well? or defer or watch.
we won't ask the officers to come again here in a courtroom <laughs> next week, so let's just get them to get on with the, the presentation, I think. Councillor Lawson? Yeah, no, I'm happy to hear the presentation. I think the members who aren't here today can always watch the presentation on the webcast, can't they? So um, I think seeing we're all here, let's at least hear the presentation and then decide what to do. Okay. Which one of you, General, is going to start, Tom? Yes, I, I will. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, uh, as you mentioned, today uh, the report in front of the committee is in relation to the uh, financial approval within the capital programme for um, uh, some £50,000 towards the implementation of one of our clean air plan measures, um, the, the Arundel Gate bus gate. Um, so, the, the, the report um, is the same report as, as, as last week. Um, just concentrating on that deferred item and we've got some wider supplementary information uh, in a presentation that we can run through for the committee now um, uh, which effectively sets the scene in terms of where we've come to in this point for the, the, the bus gate and, and why it's been implemented so we'll start running through that now if that's okay. Okay. Matt, were you going to...? Okay, yeah, thanks, Chair. So I'll just go to the first couple of slides. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, we thought it would be important just to go over the background of Arundel Gate. Um, we like to put up some nice nostalgic pictures every now and again, so this is a good one for you. Um, this is what Arundel Gate looked like a long time ago, and it's gone through a series of changes, but I think one thing which is quite clear to see is actually how much space there is on there. Um, and actually one of the things which I've realised through, through various iterations of how we tackle under Arundel Gate is how to sort out some of that pedestrian severance which happens between one side of the city to the other. Bear in mind that on the left-hand side you've got the town, on the picture, left-hand side you've got the town hall, on the right-hand side you've got the main railway station. So it's an important link through the city centre. Um, it also provides an important link north to south, south to north, not just from car traffic, but also carries significant pedestrian flows and more recently carrying a lot more active travel cycling modes as well. So. It's demonstrated quite a clear strategic link for the city. The other, the other thing to say there is that since the closure of Pinson Street, this has become the primary public transport corridor within the city. And one thing which kind of underpins a lot of the work we're doing in this area is how we can prioritise public transport and give that journey time reliability through the city centre. To back up Arundel Gate specifically, we, we've got this great statistic, which is full of 120 route which runs all the way from one end of the city to the other, probably the longest bus route we've got in the city. And it takes the bus as long to come in at Brookhill Roundabout the University and leave down by Midland Station, as it takes to get from Midland Station all the way through to Mosborough. Now that is an incredible amount of delay which is introduced within that core area of the city centre, and the bus gate is one way in which we're trying to tackle that. And it significantly does, in, does improve it, as demonstrated through the modelling of the Transforming Cities Connecting Sheffield Scheme, which I'm sure we'll get to onto in a minute. Um, the other bit as well, when you get onto Arundel Gate, um, it, it's bound by two conservation areas, which you don't actually quite realise until you kind of start to look around it. We've got the city centre one on one side, and we've got the cultural industries quarter on the other. These are areas which are going to be significantly important to achieve the local plan ambitions of 20,000 additional homes in the city. We need to be starting to get some of this interconnected infrastructure correct. And Arundel Gate and how we repurpose that, I think, is one of the, is one of the ways in which we start to look into doing that in terms of getting that pedestrian connectivity right, the viability for development to come in, and just setting that scene uh, for how the street scene looks and incorporates all the other uses within that space. When you take another quick look, and again, it's amazing when you, when you stop and actually have a look around the city, we've got some fantastic buildings in that space. They're un unbelievable, which almost have their back to Arundel Gate, and we should be really using this as an opportunity to enhance them as an asset. So you've got things like you know, the St. Paul's Tower, which, which is pretty much plonked on the middle of a dual carriageway. You've got Tudor Square and the Lyceum and the Crucible, which again are just kind of masked by the fact we've got this route which carries all this interweaving traffic behind it. These, these are bits which we want to really try to emphasise and create through the changing dynamic of how we look at the public space. I was there on Friday night and I just had a look and I saw the o there was a big uh, gig on at the O2 and I've got, you've got, kids and, and teenagers lining up on the side of a run gate and you're thinking this should be a space where we should be trying to emphasize and, and, and bring, in, bring in that life and character to the forefront of those frontages. Um, the other point as well is that we've got, I mentioned the city centre, uh, town hall and um, the station on one side. 
it caused a lot of severance. And we've done a lot of work with the, the, the kind of gold group, which connects those two spaces together. And it does feel it's, a, it's broken when it gets to a lingual gate. So part of the bigger piece here is how we can emphasize um, that, that connectivity and try to understand what pedestrian crossing facilities are needed to, to, get, across, um, the, to get across this link. And then the other thing I just want to say is, is it, it does have access to car parks. We, we're, not, we're not shying away from that. Car parking is important for the city. We're not saying it's not important. What we are saying is that we just need to try to link in in a slightly different way. So we're not cutting off the access. There's a different access. It's a changed access. We can work, and we are working with the car park operators to see how that functions. Um, in, in case of Q Park, we're providing betterment through one of the design solutions we've got through the uh, Transforming Cities Fund. Um, but the NTP is one which we've, we've probably got to think about in, in a little bit more detail. But as I said, it's not about removing access at all. It's, it's simply about uh, changing it. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of what we're proposing then, um, those which can see the screen, fantastic. Um, Joe, you might be struggling a little bit from there, but the, 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 the closure point is only in the northbound direction. It's not in the southbound, it's just in the northbound direction. And it is, if you imagine where the, where the Novotel uh, Hotel is, it's just north of, of, of that kind of small access, um, uh, kind of access roundabout they've got. Um, if you don't know your directions, north is towards the crucible. So that's where the, the bus gate would go in. Um, we are proposing it would be 24 hours as part of a, of a network management solution. And we would have the, the normal exemptions, so taxis, private hire, and hackneys. Uh, and then authorised vehicles as well. So we've, we've done a little bit of pre-engagement on what this looks like, um, and we've, we've had some requests back from some of the surrounding uh, businesses, like the, the, t uh, the, the libraries and, and the art galleries, saying, well, well actually, we need, we need some exemptions, and, and we've stuck those in. Um, we've also, as I said, we've tried to access to Charles Street is maintained, so that's where the, that's where the, um, the Q Parks is. And we've, we've, we've actually introduced, or with, with the final scheme, we'll be introducing a, a right turn south, from southbound into there. So we'll be actually improving the access. Um, and southbound is, is unchanged, but we're not touching the southbound movement um, at all. Uh, next slide, please. So why are we proposing it? Well, there's, there's two bits, really. Um, there's the connecting Sheffield element, and then there's the clean air, clean air zone element. I'll, I'll do the connecting Sheffield bit, and then we'll segue into Tom's bit around uh, the clean air zone. Um, I've kind of touched on this already, but it's all about trying to create that, that bus priority in the most strategic location, uh, and, and this is the bit within the city centre. We know by doing that, we'll bring in journey time improvements to the bus services, uh, we'll improve the reliability, and that all in all brings the benefit to the travelling public of Sheffield. Um, that's, that's really why we're doing it. Um, it also opportunes, it brings the opportunity of that, of that landscaping which I've been talking about, so really trying to enhance that you know, the built environment, we can then play around with, see how, the, how that, that greater green style infrastructure can be embedded within, within this route. Uh, wider pavements, including the active travel cycle lane, um, but also linking directly into what the Hallam University proposals are at their, at their master plan, within their master plan area, which is just fronting onto this project. We've got a lot of support from the university in that regard. And a lot of it is all about just creating the space for the, for the bus stops, uh, for the better operation. There's too much things trying to happen on Arundel Gate in this current form, and we need an intervention to help reshuffle that deck and make sure that we can get it all working. And this is, this is all part of that proposal. And then moving on to the, 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 the clean air zone bit, it, it's, it's about the, the kind of reducing the food traffic to improve that localised bit um, of, of air quality, which is being recorded on Arundel Gate. And at that point, Thanks, Mike. So, uh, one of the, the key points there is, it, is the levels of air pollution on Arundel Gate, through our assessment, required us to do more at that location than just the implementation of a, a, a CAS-C, and I'll come on some of the data in a minute. But the, the bus gate has been a core part of that overall clean air plan, which includes the clean air zone and wider measures, for, for some time now. So in, in October uh, last year, when cooperative executives supported the clean air plan, um, the bus gate on Arundel Gate was included in all of the underpinning work for that and, and included in the list of mitigation within the report. Um, the full business case that was submitted in the spring this year, um, again, 
that included as part of our overall clean air plan the bus gate on Arundel Gate. Um, the analysis and appraisal of our scheme has included the, the bus gate. And ultimately, when government signed off our submission um, and issued their further direction to us, um, by their ministerial legal direction, um, the implementation of all those measures within our full business case, our clean air plan measures, uh, are required, including the bus gate. Um, the, Sheffield has those two key, key areas that, that clearly the, the, the most well known, the most talked about is the clean air zone, the category C charging zone, um, but the bus gate is an intrinsic part of our plan. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, the analysis, um, clearly uh, when you introduce any bus gate as a traffic management measure, ultimately this one also supports cleaner air, you're going to get displacement as a result of uh, redistributing traffic movements. So the, as Matt mentioned, the, the bus gate affects northbound traffic only on Arundel Gate. South, southbound traffic can uh, do exactly as it does at the moment. It won't be impacted at all. Some of those businesses that Matt mentioned can continue to come southbound and take a right turn access into, into their um, delivery areas. Uh, the modelling that underpins our clean air plan um, is through a strategic transport model. Now that's been previously approved and endorsed by the DFT and, and also in this case through the clean air process by DEFRA. And that includes modal reassignment. So what that means is that uh, on, the, on the network that we're modelling, when you make a change to that network and, and don't allow traffic to flow through a specific point, the, the, the model will reassign those movements based on where the origin and destination of the trips are. So it's, it's an intelligent model in that sense. It doesn't just think that traffic is still going to try and get through that same point. It does redistribute it based on, on their overall journey purpose. So um, in, in, the, in the movements that are included in that model, um, it is based on um, traffic counts. It's validated against existing traffic counts. Um, and it also factors in um, the growth that we want to come forward in the city. So local plan proposals are included in those future scenarios because the reason we use a transport model is we're looking into the future. We're looking into the changes that come around the network looking at changes in the trips that are made and the demand associated with that. So um, new development growth is factored in. Um, we did, through the process of developing our preferred option and our, our final clean air plan and business case that we submitted, um, look at a range of options within the city. Um, we looked at a range of um, different categories of, of clean air zone, different shapes and sizes of clean air zone, and again, those have previously been reported through to, to, to council as, at the different stages of decision making. Um, and we did look at um, the impact of, of the bus gate and also some anti-idling measures along the Rundle Gate. So I'll come on to the detail of that in a second. So just in terms of some of the, the numbers, uh, Arundel Gate um, uh, comprises of around just shy of 1,200 uh, vehicles in a 24-hour period. Um, again, just over half of those, um, a little over half of those 6,600 odd vehicles traveling northbound in that direction of the bus gate. Again, and that's a, in a 24-hour period, Bulba. Um, as we've highlighted, um, access for clearly for buses, for taxis, for private hire vehicles, and other authorized vehicles will be allowed through the bus gate. Um, and access to Charles Street, um, any of the businesses, including the, the, the car parks um, and any other areas that require servicing, uh, and also the Novotel St Paul's access will be retained. Um, the analysis highlighted that around 2,800 vehicles are expected to be relocated from Arundel Gate onto Sheaf Street, and Sheaf Street will be the main alternative route, because uh, I know that was an issue and a question that came up last week in terms of where is the majority of the vehicles going to go to. So uh, the majority of the displaced vehicles will go on to Sheep Street, 
as the main alternative route past the past the front of the station towards Park Square in that northbound movement. Um, on Sheaf Street um, uh, this year, um, the average uh, uh, daily daily flows are about third, just shy of thirty six thousand vehicles, thirty five six seven nine. Um, next slide, please. So the, the air quality impacts of, of the change are shown in this slide. Um, the graph is probably the easiest way of kind of highlighting this. So what, what we have there is a bar chart that shows on the left-hand side a business-as-usual uh, scenario, um, and that um, is where we have uh, a, a, a current air quality levels of around at 48.2 micrograms of nitrogen dioxide per cubic meter of air. The legal limit that we're trying to achieve is that 40 micrograms of uh, nitrogen dioxide per cubic meter of air. So we, we need to do something. Business as usual doesn't work. Um, the next column along is the effects of the CAS-C scheme. You can see that there's a reduction, but it doesn't get you to compliance. Then progressively, including the bus gate, um, does have a significant effect because you're effectively not just making vehicles cleaner and you know the clean air zone will make a, a significant difference but you need to do more and actually removing some of that traffic makes it, it makes a, a big impact uh, but doesn't get you to legal compliance we then apply effects of anti-idling and, and that um, essentially gets us to legal compliance um, the modeling is based on a 24-hour uh, bus gate um, so it allows all of those vehicles in that, that are still retained through the bus gate, but all other vehicles um, would be displaced um, during that period. Um, and the last column there is just to confirm that if we did the CAS-C and anti-idling only, again, that combination just doesn't work hard enough in terms of getting us, uh, getting us over the line. Um, next slide, please. And... Obviously, when we're looking at the implications of the bus gate and air quality on Arundel Gate, we've been looking at the, the network impacts because what we have to show through our clean air plan measures is not that we're just meeting the worst locations, that everywhere across the city is compliant. Um, clearly, yes, there is some displacement of traffic. Um, the modelling confirms that displaced traffic onto Sheaf Street uh, doesn't cause uh, adverse operations of the network at that point. Um, and Sheaf Street is predicted... Um, with the bus gate and the CAS-C measures uh, to be compliant <laughs> within that legal limit. Next slide, please. So I think Matt's I think probably we'll... covered a lot of these kind of objectives, but clearly what we've included on this slide in terms of bringing together those headlines around the benefits of the clean air zone is just to reinforce that the, the, the bus gate on Arundel Gate is a key part of our Connecting Sheffield scheme. It is one of those things that opens up those opportunities for change and quite significant and transformational change in that part of the city centre. We're taking forward those principles that have been well received through Greater Green, expanding those out, committing that kind of bus priority, locking those benefit in. Then the, 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 the image on the right hand side there is the the working uh, kind of diagram for those city centre changes. Next slide, please. So in terms of where we are at the moment, clearly we've come here to kind of uh, seek the financial approval to move forward with the bus gate. Um, we have undertaken engagement with businesses and residents, as Matt said, that has already come forward with some access requirements, which we're able to accommodate. Um, and where there are changes, we've discussed some of those changes with, with businesses. Um, we haven't had any objections to the proposals to date, um, albeit there is um, a, a statutory consultation process associated with the progression of the ETRO. Um, we're, ex we're proposing to implement the scheme, as I mentioned last week, using an experimental uh, traffic regulation order that would go live in line with the CAS go live date in February. Um, we would need to make some changes on street um, to facilitate that. And the construction of the temporary arrangements on Arundel Gate are planned to commence in mid-January next year. So there is a mobilization date to, towards that um, start date on site. 
and then clearly an implementation period before going live. Um, the first six months of an experimental traffic regulation order form the statutory consultation period. Um, so any comments or objections that are received then will need to be considered as part of that review of the scheme. Um, and any decision to make that permanent, make amendments, or um, to remove um, would need to come in a following period within the first 18 months of operation. Clearly, the, one of the benefits of it running as an experimental uh, scheme are that we can make some of those changes should um, anything unforeseen through the pre-engagement, you know, not, not highlight any kind of significant issues. Um, we don't think there will be any significant issues, but it does also um, have the benefit of informing our further design development of that connecting Sheffield city centre scheme. So some of that might be around some of the detailed locations of where the bus gate starts. Um, some of that uh, may well be um, around associated measures that we want, need to make decisions on, such as the crossings on Arundel Gate, um, so that we get that right as well. And, and understanding the scheme in practice is a, a really useful way of, of informing the decisions on and the development of that permanent scheme. Um, uh, in advance of the experimental traffic regulation order going live in February, um, which is when the statutory consultation period starts, it is our intention that we will do um, a pre-engagement on pre-information stage um, of comms and associated signage on street, further direct engagement with residents, businesses that take access. And, you know, there's quite a number of businesses that take access from there, given that the St. Paul servicing yard serves all of the, the businesses really in the Peace Gardens. Um, but there'll be further information on our website, um, and we're trying to really direct information to people that are regularly driving through there as well, so we're looking at some innovative ways of, of trying to do that. Um, our legal direction, um, which is really informing the, the time scales to move forward and, and deliver, um, does require us to deliver in the shortest possible time. Um, and the, the clean air zone now with its confirmed launch date of the 27th of February, um, uh, we believe that we can uh, align the delivery of this scheme um, with that date, uh, provided we get the confirmation of the, the, the approval of the funding um, today, uh, which is funding obviously that the, the government have provided us with for the overall delivery of our clean air plan. Um, I don't think there's anything else to add, but um, we're happy to, to take any, any questions. Okay, thank you for that presentation. Uh, Councillor Otten. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, again, I don't think we've decided whether we're going to decide this today yet, but I, I have a number of questions following that, so if we're happy to proceed for the moment, um, I'll, I'll ask those. Yeah, carry on. Yeah. So, um, firstly, thank you for the figures on, on the, the air quality uh, on... Arundel Gate and, and the and the issue of displacement on the Sheep Street. I, I am I am a little bit curious on a couple of points on that. Um, you've, you gave a headline figure for what the ultimate air quality is expected to be on Sheep Street, so it's not clear how much that is going up by. I mean, it would be unfortunate if we were displacing poor air, even if it was from a slightly higher level, you know, level to a lower area. It, 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 it would be unfortunate if in displacing we were actually creating more pollution than we were we were removing, if you see what I mean. Um, so I don't know if you, if you have the figure on that. And I am a little bit puzzled why why Sheep Street is, is better than Rundle Gate, given the figures you showed, it has more traffic, it's, you know, lower down, which <laughs> means that the pollution it's tends to, road, tend yeah. to accumulate. Yeah, it's a ring road. It's, it, and it's right next to a railway station, which has diesel trains idling. Yeah, I would have expected the figures to be worse on Sheep Street than Rundle Gate. So I don't know if there's any kind of logic to that. I mean, uh, yeah, do you want to answer that and then come back with the others, thanks? Yep, happy to, happy to answer that. So, um, again, there's, there's, there's various reasons for some of that. Um, some of it is in relation to the um, type of vehicles and the, the, the behaviour of some of those vehicles on Arundel Gate. So, larger vehicles that do idle is a clear issue. Um, uh, we've We've obviously done, run an appraisal of what the benefits of tackling anti-idling are, but that doesn't stop idling. 
um, there are a number of issues associated with, with that. Um, uh, there are various points on uh, Arundel Gates and Canyon in effect um, as well with the, with the tall buildings. Um, but there are, there are a range of issues that, that lead to that. So the, clearly wherever there is a, a higher level of, of traffic, um, we would expect to see higher levels of pollution, but it isn't just related to the traffic volumes overall. Okay, thank you. For, thank you for that. Well, okay, I'm happy to accept then, you know, on, on, on that basis, the figures we've been given in terms of the, the impacts on Sheep Street and Arundel Gate. Um, question two, I'm slightly puzzled about the, the nature of the direction that we have. I, I, was, I, I came to the last week's meeting under the impression we didn't really have a choice about this. And I was advised that we did kind of have a choice. And we seem to be hearing that we don't really have a choice again. So um, the nature of the direction... Um, I don't know if anybody can clarify whether it's yourselves or whether it's... Uh... I think it's David again. No, Tom. Oh, yeah. Tom again. So, yeah, thank you. And David will kind of do a long kick if I get it wrong. But um, essentially, we're directed to um, implement in the shortest possible time our approved um, kind of business case, which is our clean air plan, which sets out all of those different measures for Sheffield, the CASI, and, and the Busgate predominantly. So we are, uh, and that is in line with our approved uh, business case. So our uh, business case had assumptions that underpin it. Some of the assumptions for the, 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 the bus gate are that it was a 24-hour bus gate. And um, so implementing in line with our approved plan effectively means moving forward in the shortest possible time to introduce this, this bus gate. Again, we are proposing because it is our case that we've been making today, that it'll be a 24-hour bus gate. Um, and that, that's in like, so not all bus gates in Sheffield are 24-hour. Um, a number of them are. Um, some of them have trams running through them as well as buses. Um, but yeah, there is a range. Uh, but because um, of the air quality issues, and we need to work as, as hard as we could to reduce down the uh, air quality in this location, and that the 24-hour bus gate didn't do that in isolation, um, we, we're proposing that it's a 24-hour bus gate, and that's, that's what our clean air plan that we are directed to implement um, reflects. To, before I bring in councillors, uh, Jenny, comment? I'm not sure that answers my question. I'm not, the, the nature of the direction that we have, do we really have a choice here? Okay. Um, that's the question. <laughs> the choice before you... Well, let, let's one step back. The decision that is before you today is to approve the funding and to put on the capital programme the works for the bus gate. Um, to implement the clean air plan to the timescales, we need to do the work, we need to start the works on the bus gate by January. So whether the bus gate is 24 hour or whatever timing, isn't a decision before you and actually isn't time critical in the way, although it needs to be by the time we start doing the works and putting the signs up. But whether we have a bus gate isn't really an option because that is part of the approved clean, clean air plan. To change that would require a new direction. It would require all the remodeling and a new direction because the direction is to implement that bus gate. There's a slight difference between the data, whether it's the timing of the bus gate, and there might be something that uh, Tom will correct me if I'm wrong on it. So I was going to correct him if he was wrong. He'll correct me if I'm wrong. Um, some of those assumptions, if we can still show compliance using the modelling, some of the assumptions might be able to agree, be agreed with government without a new direction and going to the minister to issue a new direction. So I think that's where there's an element of flexibility and that's where we ended up with the, the different concessions that we got for Agni carriages going in later and, low, and that was why it had to be local, um, um, yeah, local exemptions for the vans because otherwise the wider exemption would have changed the nature of the direction and the nature of the, uh, the, the plan. Right, thank you. I think, I think, I think I've, I've got all that. Okay, so it's, 
Yeah, yeah. It's, okay. it, it, yeah, no, okay. So, I mean, I mean, the final question was, um, and maybe it's not relevant, but I do wonder where, where this decision, you know, it's, it's, it feels very late in the day, for what you say, to be thinking about the Busgate now in terms of whether it's the council's view that this should go in. Um, so I'm, I'm slightly baffled when that was first decided by, by the council. This is what we wanted as part of our plan that we then get a direction for. Um, but maybe it's, maybe it's too late to be relevant, but I would like to know when and how that was first decided. Tom? So, can I just ask a clarification, if that's okay, Chair? Do, do, you, do you mean when was it first determined that we needed to, as part of the clean air zone, introduce the, the bus gate? Because the, just in terms of the background, um, what, what came forward probably first, I think, is the kind of aspiration that, that we've outlined around how do we make bus routes through the city centre more coherent, more reliable, in, in the round, trying to make that as attractive as possible. Um, that stemmed from the connecting Sheffield proposals. Um, but what we were doing at the same time is a parallel piece of work around the clean air zone. Now, within the modelling that I described, I mentioned that there's various things that influence trips around a network. One of them is changes to the network. Now, we hadn't modelled the connecting Sheffield scheme and the bus gates uh, and changes in the city centre because they weren't yet confirmed and committed. Decisions were still to be made on those. But what we knew was we had an issue on Arundel Gate where just the clean air zone wasn't doing enough. Now, at that point, there were options around going to category D, which included all private cars that, that weren't compliant, or doing something more focused and local on Arundel Gate. So there was already a scheme that we knew about, but it just wasn't going to be implemented in time, a lot, you know, the permanent connecting Sheffield scheme. So we brought that forward into the clean air mix because we were looking at network management proposals, traffic management changes to reduce down the number of vehicles and improve air quality. So that's where it, there's an alignment to the clean air zone. So it's, it's always been in our plan pre um, the decision last October. So last October confirmed that it would be part of our mitigation and introduced early as part of the clean air zone. But there's always been an ongoing um, of twin tracking of the clean uh, the, the bus gate proposals to satisfy our air quality challenges quickly on Arundel Gate, but the complementary connecting Sheffield scheme, which will bring forward the wider transformational change as part of a, an aligned project. Okay, could I thank just you? So that's October, October 21, was that? Sorry, so yeah. October 2021 is when cooperative executive. Okay, thank you. So can I just bring in Sorry, it was only just to confirm that it's 26th of October. There was a special meeting of cooperative executive that approved proceeding with the clean air plan. And I've, I've got the report up, and it does mention wider traffic management measures required northbound only bus gate on Arundel Gate from a point north of Nova Tell access. And I can confirm that having looked over Dave's shoulder, it's 1.12. <laughs> it does, no, no, you know, yeah, yeah I'm long sighted. But, um, I was going to bring Martin, but I've got a question, so. I, I, okay. There is this question mark over duration. So could I ask you if I was to propose a 12 hour bus gate, what would be the air quality consequences? Have you done any modelling? So um, we haven't done any uh, precise modelling on a 12-hour bus gate, um, primarily because of the, the, the information, the data that I shared earlier in terms of the, the, the bus gate that's been placed. What I, what I know is from the, the most recent traffic counts on um, Arundel Gate is that about 25% of the, the traffic on Arundel Gate going northbound um, is between 7 p.m. overnight to 7 a.m. So there's a, about a quarter of the traffic that is going along Arundel Gate at that time. Um, so in, in the round, um, there will be an air quality disbenefit in a, a, on Arundel Gate in allowing traffic through mm -hmm. even between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. Now, what that means kind of 
you know, in actual air quality numbers in terms of nitrogen dioxide, we, we haven't undertaken the modelling. The modelling, as I mentioned, is based on 24 hour because of the information that it's, we have at the time. It's something I'm very keen on, and particularly, say, it's 25% of the traffic, but how much of that are in buses? How many is that going to be taxis? And actually, yeah. basically, then it's that non bus lane compliant vehicle numbers and what that does to the modelling because those other, i.e. the taxis yeah. and the buses are going to go through that bus gate come what may. The things that aren't going to go through there are it's in essence the private, uh, the private vehicles and the vans and lorries and I'd like to have a number really before me to give me some confidence that actually a 12 hour mark still be okay for us rather than 24 hour given its implications on city trade um, i just like to leave that with you martin yeah thank you chair my, my question was on that subject but slightly different for my education if nothing else um i, I really like that graph you showed with the the, the red column and the, the the green column um from an expert i understood that so how do we measure air quality. So is the target set like an average air quality over 24 hours? And, and that's kind of linked to what uh, Councillor Mohammed said. So you can see where I'm getting at. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a really good question. The, the, the air quality target that we set is to uh, achieve annual average compliance. So it's a calendar year that we're looking over in terms of the average NO2 levels, nitrogen dioxide levels over that period. So that, that's how it's appraised and assessed. And, and ultimately, that's, that's what we'll need to monitor to show that we are compliant. And um, again, to, to any further kind of change or potential close, close down of the clean air zone scheme to make sure that we are remaining compliant and any further changes. Um, so that, that's how it's measured. It isn't, there are different air quality requirements, you know, some, some which statutory and, and legally binding in terms of air quality emissions, but for our clean air zone direction, that, that is effectively the acid test. Okay, thank you. Um, I may have a more detailed question, but not for this meeting. I might give you an email on that. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, on one of your slides, you put up some figures about traffic movements. And I just want to point a clarification, please. Um, as I understand it, you said there's about 11,850 movements a day, both ways, and 12, uh, 2,800 of those vehicles will be relocated. That means they won't be going through that gate. Is that right? That's roughly 25%. So you're, gonna, you're looking for a 25% reduction. Is that right? So... The 25% the I referred to is from looking at actual um, traffic counts on Arundel Gate. About 25% of the traffic and the trips on Arundel Gate are between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. So the, the reduction that we're ultimately aiming to achieve on Arundel Gate from a clean air zone perspective is that almost magic number of legal levels of nitrogen dioxide, which is 40 micrograms per cubic meter of air. So the way in which we appraise that is we, we test the implications on vehicle movements within our transport model, and then we use further information to run that through an air quality model. So there are different stages that we take that through. And the air quality modelling stage also includes things like background air quality as well. So the influence of emissions from, from significant buildings, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's what we're looking for. And the reduction that we're looking for is, is almost from that, that high 40s on Arundel Gate down to that 40. So it, it's not, it, the 25% is mainly the overnight kind of average tr trips that are, are happening on Arundel Gate whereas actually the, the acid test for the clean air zone and our legal requirements around that are to get down to that 40 micrograms per cubic metre on an annual average across a calendar year. So at, at, the, at no kind of one date will we be able to see 
monitoring information along the gate and just say, we've cracked it, it's, it's, you know, it's 40 today, so that's great. It is that annual average. So this is where we'll probably understand our um, kind of final success criteria around spring 2024, following on from the implementation of the clean air zone uh, next February. So we'll have monitored the impact of that um, and obviously the, the kind of exemptions and the upgrades and everything else we'll be monitoring and reporting back on. But ultimately it will be in early 2024 where we're able to do that look back and, and kind of confirm whether we've been legally compliant across the whole of Sheffield at those legal levels. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that 25%, if I've got it right, and I recognise I might not, there's a, there's a coincidence in the figures. I just, it's, if it's 11,850 currently, and you're take, putting 2,800 onto Sheep Street, that means that roughly 9,000 vehicles will still be going through the gate. Is that a, a correct assumption? Okay, so, yeah, so again, the, the gate is just northbound only. Yeah. So 6,600 in our appraisal going north, 2,800 will be displaced onto Sheaf Street. Uh, even if all of the other traffic were, were still on a, a Rundle gate, um, that, that effectively is about 3,800. If 25% of that was the, as it is now, broadly 7 p.m. till 7 a.m., that, that leaves you about 2,850 vehicles going through there between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. So the, the key part to that is whilst it's overnight, those emissions are still occurring along that stretch of road, would the, would the reintroduction in a modelling and appraisal sense of 25% of that northbound traffic um, have a, an adverse effect? Yes, it would, because those emissions will still be happening instead of not happening in our, in our assessment. But would they be um, so adverse to make, make us non-compliant um, I don't have that, and we haven't got that, that final position on that because our, our proposal was for a 24-hour bus gate for the reasons that we're close to non-compliance and have had to add additional measures into a rundle gate from the anti-idling to achieve and convince government that we will be compliant. So that, that's where we are at the moment. Do you want to? Thank you. So thanks, Chair. I wanted to come back on your question about the, the 12 hour. Um, and in terms of the, the traffic order procedure, if it's experimental traffic order, if we propose a 24 hour bus gate, we can, we, through the stages of implementation, there's flexibility. So we could use that and then just only put it in for 12 hours if that was what was, was recommended. So you, there is, this is one of the reasons why we're doing the ETRO because it allows us to see how things happen, how things change, whether things are too much, whether things are, whether they're not enough, you have to go out and reorder. But the, the, the point is, is if we went for something which was this big or for a high, high length of time, then you can always rein it back in again. So the implementation is, 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 is flexible. And uh, I mentioned uh, in terms of the 18-month the maximum period that an experimental traffic regulation order can run for before a decision has to be made about whether you're making it permanent as it, sta and as it has been in, making any changes or removing. Then again, that some of that review point could come sooner than the 18 months. It could come three months after implementation, six months after implementation. You must have that statutory six-month period if you're running you know, a, an experimental TRO up to or beyond six months. Uh, but there is a, a point where we could review the scheme that is in and take an, an assess and an informed position, looking at some of the data on a Rundle gate, both the traffic data, some of the monitored information around air quality um, to, uh, you know, to bring back to be considered. Angela? Just a very straight forward question. Can you confirm that from the data modeling, you have said that even with a 24 hour gate on its own, we wouldn't be below the 40 um, milligrams and therefore 
uh, you get to add in the anti-idling, and mm -hmm. therefore that's why we need to have a 24-hour gate plus the anti-idling, um, because otherwise we're not going to be compliant. Is that correct? That, that's correct. So that is what we have tested and submitted to government as part of our proposals. I, mean, I was just going to say, you know, there's something really neat about this scheme in that it just brings lots of things together. Um, you know, so obviously you've got, you know, the, the actual chance to improve bus services. And, you know, we, we've all heard enough about politicians really bleating on about how bad bus services are. But where we've got something actually in our hands to do something about bus services, we can actually do them. And that's really good. But it's also tied up with the clean air. And actually, I, I want to go back to the, the graph of the different interventions on the clean air zone there. Um, I don't know if you can find that one. That one there. And just looking at, um, you know, the measures that are needed just to get us to dip under that, the, the dotted line, which is the, the limit of where we're actually breaking the law by exceeding that as opposed to not breaking the law by coming in under it. But compare it with, um, I'm just looking at... Um, what the World Health Organization actually accepts as its guidelines now uh, for what is an acceptable level of um, air quality for people in this city to breathe. And it's, it's the very bottom of those lines, isn't it? It's the 10 micrograms per cubic meter. And I'm wondering when we're going to get to that point. You know, we're, we're going in the right direction. You can see by the, you know, the work that's been done there. But, I mean, what more are we going to do to do this? I mean, bear in mind, we've just voted to keep a generator running in the city centre uh, an extra 10 grand a month. Um, you know, there is a lot more we need to do, and we, we can't be backing off from this right now. But I just wanted to ask about um, the, so the other aspect, and, and no one's mentioned this yet, is the benefits to um, pedestrian safety um, going through Android Gates. And just when we were talking about, you know, the, the use of the... Of the of Andor Gate at night. So, yeah, I think we all accept there are fewer cars on there. So, you know, a few buses and taxis. But if you're around there at night, you see some people, and you're talking about private drivers who don't have anything to lose. You know, we're, we're not worrying about professional drivers who basically drive carefully because they have consequences to that. But you get some people zoom fast through there. And it is a dangerous environment sometimes. So a lot of the residents in my ward... Um, you know, when you think about the number of people who live really close there, the number of people who live in you know, St. Paul's, the number of students going backwards and forwards past Howland University, you know, going, going to the, the Odeon, I think the, the O2 there. Um, there's a lot there. I mean, I don't know if we've got any information on the sort of the improvement in, in, in road safety, and it may not be something we can really quantify. Um, but I just want to put it out there. That, you know, this is actually talking about improving the living environment um, for you know, a lot of people in a dense area and which we anticipate to increase over the next 15 years. We've got that all set out in the proposals for local plan. So I'm just wondering what, what more we can do to, to build on this. Um, because, I mean, this is you know, an incredibly serious situation. And I, can, I can't believe, of course, you know, lots of people in this room were you know, complaining that there have been delays in bringing in the clean air plan and everyone's saying, I can't understand why the clean air plan hasn't been brought in straight away. You know, and yet we're still talking about, you know, very small details of it, uh, as if there's some problem with actually improving the air and making buses run faster. Um, I mean, am I missing something here? <laughs> Councillor Williams, I know Joe posed a question to us, I'll come back to it, but it's just a question about your uh, modelling. Does it take into account the impact of those, the vehicles that are going to be forced to turn? So the, uh, the modelling takes into account uh, that if, if vehicles can't go north beyond the Novotel, um, then they will have to take a different route. So is your question around the turn at the point of the bus gate or at Furnival Gate Roundabout? No, it's, at, it's at the point of the gate. Yeah, so... I, essentially, what we'll be doing is we'll be introducing um, a, advanced signing um, to inform and advise drivers that if they are ultimately going to try to get towards Park Square, um, that they will need to turn right at Furnival Gate or, or, or take a different route. Um, 
Clearly, if you're getting access beyond Furnival Gate roundabouts into Charles Street or Novotel, then again, we'll need to inform drivers that they can still do that because that is a, a movement we're retaining. Um, if people miss that signage um, for any reason and proceed to try and go towards the bus gate, then there will be some amendments to that access at the Novotel to, in the in, in inter, intermediate phase, the initial implementation phase, to accommodate a turn back. Now, the permanent scheme will look quite different to that. Um, the um, location of the greater green, greater green phase three, or is it phase two? Phase two, near Castlegate. I don't know if you're familiar with, with that scheme, but at Castlegate, where we've actually closed Castlegate itself um, and made some significant improvements um, to the public realm down there. Um, if you carry on towards, I think it's Blanc Street, um, then there is a, a, a mini roundabout turn back facility. But again, we want people to um, kind of avoid getting to that point. And again, there's signage that informs you that if you go beyond, yes, you'll get access to the hotels on Blanc Street and the car park, but to go beyond, you'll be going through a bus gate. Now, people then are advised to turn down early and to go past the Hilton to, in, you know, towards the ring road in that direction. So it'll be very, very similar to that. Now, the, the signage needs to be really clear. We need to make sure that people do understand the consequences of the choices that they'll need to make. Um, but again, the, the team are prepared in terms of designing for that. And again, as part of that experimental process, if further changes are required to make sure that it is as obvious and to inform that final detailed design of the Connecting Sheffield scheme, we'll be you know, looking at the, the implications of, of, of the experimental period. I think just to add, Councillor Williams, is um, when we put an ETRO on, and when we advertise it, it goes on one network, which is picked up by TomTom, Tom, Google, and also all that NASP pick it up. So we hope that will start impacting routing strategies through mobile phone devices, et cetera, from, from day one. So, you know, we're hoping with the pre-engagement work, which we're looking to put in the, the, the signage, the website stuff, then we'll start to socialize this message early so people aren't kind of caught out. You would appreciate whenever you do anything like this, it, inevitably it's gonna happen, but it should be insignificant on the greatest, greater appraisal period. And just to go back, Chair, to Councillor Johnson's question about, so okay, in terms of road safety and wider benefit, that has been picked up in the Transforming Cities Fund business case, uh, picked up mainly through transport user benefit. There's matrices we can use with reducing traffic flows and improving pedestrian environments, et cetera, which have a monetized benefit towards that. Um, but also we improve place, place making improvements as well within that value for money category. So the benefit cost ratio for the scheme is picking up that wider, that those, those wider improvements, which are not necessarily part of a clean air zone plan, but certainly part of a, of a transport scheme appraisal. Well, thanks for that, because uh, road safety stats right across South Yorkshire are still unacceptable, so anything that makes the road safer, especially in the city centre where you've got a lot of people going about, and especially young people, uh, that's got to be a good thing. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to return to the question that you posed right at the beginning that might make the discussion we've had a bit academic, but Joe? Yeah, so well, I'm, I'm conscious that the reason we're here today is that Councillor Lodge um, proposed, uh, you know, we, co we come back with more information on this, and then I think I forget whether I seconded it. One of our, one of our, one of us seconded that, um, and we've had some more information, but we don't have we don't have Councillor Lodge. I'm, I'm I'm slightly looking at Councillor Wood as to whether you know you think you know Councillor Lodge's mind on this. I think we have two options really. One is to um, one is to defer for to another week for more information on the on the um, on the on the 12 hour bus gate option um, the other option i think and this may may be preferable i see what members think is to uh, you know approve the because we are only approved the capital funding the decision to do bus gate has been made last year as we've been told um, but to uh, refer the question of the time of the bus gate back to trc because i think that's probably a better place for it to be decided than in this group um, and we can make a referral. We are in our gift to refer any matter to them that's in their remit, I'm sure. Um, so, that, so that, you know, obviously the, the programme doesn't need to wait for, 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 for capital approval. 
but that the you know that we're not saying we're endorsing the 24-hour bus gate today because I, I think we do need more information. I'm, I mean, I don't know if Councillor Wood has a view well, on, on what I'm his gonna, colleagues I'm think. I'm going to bring to discussion yeah, in a second, but Paul, as and when you're ready. Yeah, I mean, that's just going. To... Just going to bring Paul. Is Paul's just typing? Sorry to put you on the spot, I should have given you more notice. I'll be deferred till next week as I have an HD opportunity to speak to colleagues. Defer. Defer. Okay. Well, I just prefer to get this done so we don't have to go for the same information all over again, yet again. But I think, I think Jane misheard what Joss was saying. So the point about um, ETROs is that um, if you set one up where it's authorised for 24 hours, that gives... Um, the council, the officer, flexibility to reduce it or whatever. If you set it at 12 hours, it just means that, you know, that hands are, are tied. You know, so it, it's all part of the package of work, though. We don't need to decide it separately. And, it, and councils have got to recognise, you know, you're not here to micromanage things. Otherwise, we'd end up with all sorts of disasters. <laughs> I mean, thank you. That was, that was my concern. I think this is why possibly it's a TRC matter rather than coming back to SNR again. Um, but, but it's, it's it, yeah, um, and this is only capital approval. But, I mean, it, again, I mean, Councillor Woods made his, his, his view known, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious he's the only representative of his party here. So, Can I just yeah, get some yeah, views from Angela, who's similar to Douglas? Yeah, I think that we can make a capital kind of approval decision because we have to have a gate whether we have a 12, um, 12 hours or a 24 hours, but I also agree that we don't need to tell officers okay. how to do their job. Okay. Yeah, all right. Um, that leaves you two guys on the side. If I, I'm just trying to work out whether um, Angela and Douglas are agreeing with Joe or not, so that we, by approving the capital approvals bit, we're effectively deferring it to, or referring it to TRC. I, I, yeah. So my 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 second my second suggestion was that we approve the capital, but we we refer, refer because it's, it, you know it, as it stands, it goes through and it's a twenty four hour bus gate, but we refer the question of the duration of the bus gate to TRC. I think that might be a sensible thing, rather than having it come to SNR again. I think it might be a sensible thing. I, I don't know if it will satisfy. Um, obviously, the Labour group, they chair that committee, they still have the chance to, to, to have their say just in that forum rather than this one. I think possibly this committee has spent enough time on this. Can I just put you yeah. on notice, Paul? I won't mind you coming back on this as you type in. Richard, do you have anything? Yeah. I mean, I'm also minded that Council Lodge did propose it. I also would like, I know Douglas says micromanage, but I would, would like some more information about what's 12 hour or 14 hour modelling does and it's only a week and officers did say they need to have something in place decision by January so next week is still December. Paul are you finished typing? Y yes Angela. I'm just conscious of the fact that last week we asked these officers to come back with another report. So they've, you know, and they've had a week to come back to us with a presentation. Now, what you're suggesting is that we ask them to come back again next week with another report or another presentation. I, I, I think it's really kind of. Well. Would agree with Councillor Ott and we approve the funding. Well, to answer Martin's question, I, mean, I think I am on the same page as Joe that we approve the capital funding. There will no doubt be opportunities for um, you know, going over this all again because I'm sure the uh, Transport and Climate Change Committee won't miss any opportunity to go round and round in circles once more or at least several times more. Richard, do you want to comment or? Yeah, I just really was going to say I agree agree with Councillor Otten. I think we can we can approve the uh, the capital spend because as it's saying there's no choice anyway. Um, the final, whether it's 12 or 24 hour, I think should go back to the Transport Committee. 
Councillor Watson. Um, thank you. So if I may make it as a formal proposal that the, the an amendment to the recommendations is that yes, we agree the proposed additions to the capital programme, list appendix one comma, and refer the question of the duration of the bus gate to the Transport Regeneration and Climate Committee. Do a second it, Paul? Seconded by Paul. Right. Sorry. Sure, yeah. Go on. Um, are you okay to amend the recommendation to that? Because I'm mindful that it's an officer recommendation. I think you can do an additional, uh, a, 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 additional proposal. I think, I think we just be, need to be mindful that TRC will be in the same constraints that, that we've outlined about compliance and things. So I think and if it's an ETRO, they'll not be making the decision on the ETRO. But I don't see any issue with the, the discussion around the hours and if there's further modelling being taken to TRC for that discussion. Yes, I'm happy to make that as an additional recommendation that TRC consider the duration of the bus gate. Douglas? Um, just wanted to check... Um, are you proposing that it's in any way designed to hold up the work, or is the work okay to go ahead? Appreciate that you know, for the reason I said before, you know, that the hours can be altered at any time, can't they? So there doesn't need to be a hold up of the work. Can, can we just get that you're not trying, not proposing that we hold up the work? Is, is that it? Um, I don't believe it's in our. It's a decision for us whether or not to hold up the work. I think I'm just, uh, you know. So I, you know, that's. I, I think we're, we're we're approving the capital for, uh, for the capital so that. You know the capital spending go ahead. How and when, and you know, and what they do about it is a matter for TRC. I think. Um, okay, so my question is really: Are we actually making a decision on on the cash approval so that officers can actually get on with the things we're employing them to do, or is did, it that did, things are on hold pending um, TRC? I think. Did you, mate, if I may, um, Douglas, a moment ago you accused me of not understanding the point about the. Yeah. Uh, nature of the experimental traffic regulation order. I'm going to throw that straight yeah. back at you now because I think you'll, you, you know, the explanation we have of that is that it's, um, there's sufficient flexibility within that for TRC to be able to take a view and, 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 and that not to, I, I don't believe there's any need to hold up the work I, for that to happen. As Chair, I'm stopping that to wait. And so David wants to come in. Did you do it? Yeah, I, it, it wouldn't hold up the work because um, I, that would be my view on the, the decision. And I think that the referral, as it is, is flexible enough for, as Joe has said, to TRC to consider when and at what point it might want to consider that, and whether that's at the outset of the ETRO or part way through, or at, you know, it will, they will be seized off it at the end of the ETRO anyway. So, okay, we see. Oh, Richard, sorry, sorry Chair. Just ask a simple question: uh, Are there any financial implications? From a capital perspective, of switching, having two different potential times, I think with signage, for example. Um, depending on when that change was made, I think is my response to that. So uh, minimal, though. So uh, and well within any kind of public contingency and risk associated with the, the project. So um, it, that that could be accommodated, even if it were that we had to bring back a slight variation to a finance subcommittee or SNR at another capital then? I think one, one thing we'll say is whether it's a bus gate for 12 hours or 24 hours consequence, it's still going to be a bus gate. The, the, the fundamental difference yeah. will be whether it says 24 hours or whatever on a sign. Um, the, more, the more practical bit is we want to get on with the pre-engagement as soon as possible for the people of Sheffield to know what's happening. That might be influenced, the message of that might be influenced in it, whether it's a 12 or a 24. That, that's on the project side, I think that's probably the biggest risk yeah I think that's the, the first dependency because that's the first mm -hmm. thing to, to go in terms of communication information sharing with um, the public on on the bus gate proposals so they were able to kind of in advance of the bus gate going in get people used to that and to kind of look at information on our website or or, or you know on other places okay we had earlier from councillor Otten and second by Councillor Wood. Um, my, my preference would have been to have deferred to allow colleagues next week to have a vote on it, but it, it's clear from what I've heard and from what I'm hearing that actually the decision to have a bus gate was done in October the 26th, 2021. 
And so basically, in essence, the only thing we've got before us today is agreeing the 50,000 capital to allow those works, but clearly this committee hasn't decided the duration, just want to be very clear, that'll be a decision for transport committee. So we're all clear with that. Do I, what's the formal words I need to say now? given I'm not normally the chair. Are we in agreement with, can, can we just take a, do, should we need to take a vote on Councillor Otten's proposal? Well, yeah, I think if we take it that Councillor Otten's pro proposed an additional, um, that um, TRC consider the hours of the bus gate. Okay. And that Councillor Wood seconded that. Yeah. So you've then got votes on the original recommendation and then that proposed or seconded so do we do take them as together or individually? Take them separately. Okay, so should we do Joe's and Councillor Woods on that proposal? Can all those in agreement please show? One, two, three, four. Against? Yeah. Or abstention? Yeah. Against? Yeah. They're against. Well, it's lost, isn't it? One, two, three, four, I didn't even vote, so. Okay. It's carried chair. It's carried chair, right. <laughs> Can we now move to the other bit, which was the original office recommendation to allocate £50,000 to implement the bus gate decision of October 21. £50,000, okay, that's all in agreement. There is no further items, oh, <laughs> yeah, sorry, just a bit of housekeeping in that um, last week an item on GP hubs was considered at this meeting and it was stated that it would be deferred to today to add as an, ur as an urgent item. Um, it's not on the agenda because the agenda was published before that decision. But that is now on the agenda for the extraordinary meeting of this committee on the 19th of December. So it's just to note that no action taken today because it's on the agenda for the 19th of December. Um, before we all go, I just want to kind of, particularly for those who are watching from home, may notice that quite a few of us are wearing jackets here because of the cold weather. But actually, you know, over the last 10 days, we are, we've had a community of 2,000 households I've really struggled and I just want to use this opportunity to say that the City Council is out there, the Chief Executive is out there, the Leader of Council has been there, I've been there on several occasions and we will be working tirelessly to support the residents of Stannington and Mailing Bridge and Hillsborough through this very difficult time. You know, we can feel the cold today but we've got the luxury of going back to a warm home tonight. Unfortunately, there's lots of households still. So I just thought I'd take that as uh, given I've got the chair. With that, with that, can I remind members that the meeting next week is at 10.30 on Monday and the next scheduled meeting of this committee is on the 24th of January and that concludes today's business. And thank everyone for those who could attend and apologies for colleagues who weren't.